Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, or wherever it is, wherever it is that you're connecting from. Um, I'm really very pleased to welcome you all to this webinar on uh, mental health and psychosocial support for refugees, uh, migrants, and asylum seekers during, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this is part of the weekly series hosted by United for Global Mental Health, the Mental Health uh, Innovation Network, the Lancet Psychiatry, and MHPSS.net. Um, this webinar is being recorded and you are invited uh, very warmly to, to tweet your comments using the hashtag um, COVID19MH. Some of the panelists will be online after the webinar to uh, interact uh, with questions for about 15 to 20 minutes after the session. My name is Anand Galapati and I'm the uh, co-director of the online platform MHPSS.net. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd just like to say that it's been very meaningful for us to help uh, convene this series um, on so many key issues that profoundly affect the lives of millions of people around the world. Um, as we know only too well, the, the topics we discuss in this series are not only about issues that are out there, but are also in this very particular global crisis um, about those who are very close at hand. Um, they affect people in our own communities. And the topic today is no exception. Um, as our panel from across the globe discusses um, how COVID-19 has um, impacted the already fraught circumstances of refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers, uh, in particular uh, circumstances or, or, in, or in countries or regions, uh, the vulnerabilities that they speak about will probably resonate with uh, the circumstances of people in our own settings. And it's for this reason that I'm especially pleased uh, to introduce the panel and the chair for this session, uh, Guglielmo Skinina, uh, known around the world uh, to his international colleagues as Guli. Um, for the last 11 years, Guli has been the head of uh, mental health, psychosocial response, and intercultural communication at IOM, the UN Migration Agency, um, where he has worked uh, since the Kosovo um, conflict in the late 1990s. Um, Guli, um, the panel is yours. Thanks, Ananda. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm very grateful to be chairing this webinar today on a matter, mental health and psychosocial support for all migrants that is of the utmost importance for the International Organization for Migration. This, as you properly say, have been troubling times psychologically for most of us. Being isolated, having to manage one most important relationships remotely, fearing to lose one's job while not being able or being sure about what social security will come after, having to adapt to a totally new way of life very rapidly not being able to uh, understand which information provided by the media is reliable or not, being perceived as a possible threat by people around you, are all very distressing experiences. These very experiences, however, are common to many migrants worldwide in their everyday life. They were so before and probably and unfortunately will be so to a certain extent after the pandemic. However, while this uh, makes or should make the psychological experiences of migrants more relatable to all of us, it does not uh, uh, make to any extent the psychological experience of COVID-19 any easier for migrants. It's not that they are more prepared because they have faced it uh, not before. Because migrants even today, even in the most developed countries, enjoy an unequal access to healthcare and mental health care or an access that is dependent on their legal status. And this is obviously, at a time, a time of pandemic, something that is, uh, uh, is always unfair at a time of pandemic and becomes frightening. Because migrants are more likely to live precarious housing and working conditions, because they have bleaker economic prospects. And with closure of borders, it becomes more difficult for them to go back home if they wish, or in other situations, they are forcibly and abruptly repatriated you know, from their host countries. They are even farther than all we are from their loved ones and more exposed to media disinformation because you know the, the, the messages they perceive are in languages that they might not fully master. Uh, so far, I'm aware I've been generalizing a bit because if we consider a migrant anyone who has moved from their habitual place of residence to another for whatever reason, irrespective of legal status, so if we don't use international or national law to define what migrant is, then we are talking about an estimated 1 billion people in the world, a multitude of populations, situations, contexts, legal definition 
that would be impossible to sum up in a one fit all discussion like this webinar. We today so are discussing um, the psychosocial needs and resources of four specific categories of migrants. And when I use the word categories, I'm doing it with a lot of reluctance because uh, categorization of human being is always something that is not, uh, um, let's say, going in the direction of their well-being. But uh, let's be using this you know, for easiness you know, during the process of this webinar. So Peter Ventevowell from UNSCR, a good friend of mine, will focus on those who are forcibly displaced either internally to a country or internationally, as asylum seekers and refugees are. Uh, 80 million of them, according to the last UNHCR estimates from last, uh, last week. Teresa Hombalo is the coordinator of the Interagency MHPSS, Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Reference Group in Ethiopia, and she will focus on economic migrants who are returning back home, either forcibly because they are expelled from the country where they are working on voluntarily because of the pandemic. Rama Idamashan, as program director of SNEHA, a Mumbai-based NGO, will bring the perspective of internal migrants in megalopolis, like in India, like, as I said, Mumbai in India. And finally, Lynn, Lynn Jones, who is a child psychiatrist, and she will hate me for that, but a legendary pioneer in the field of mental health in humanitarian setting, will discuss how poor migration management mechanisms can affect the emotional and psychosocial well-being of migrants. We always think that you know, the problems of migrants and refugees come from the past. Very often, they come from the present, and we are, to a certain extent, the ones creating. You know? We, I mean, uh, countries who host them, you know, to a certain extent, the ones creating uh, this, uh, this problem. Uh, with, uh, not, I don't want to spend too much time in introduction because the discussion will be a very lively one, and I would like to start uh, uh, discussing with Peter. Peter is the Senior uh, Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Specialist at UNHCR. He's a psychiatrist and a cultural anthropologist by background, and before reaching the headquarters of his organization, has worked extensively in the field, from Afghanistan to Burundi and many other countries. Um, Peter, my question for you is uh, threefold. So the first one is uh, what are the ways in which uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, is impacting uh, on the lives of refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced people around the world? And uh, how is this impact uh, building up on pre-existing psychosocial vulnerabilities of these, uh, of these categories of migrants? Uh, and what are the outcome in terms of mental health and psychosocial support of this combination of elements? And then uh, uh, the third part will be from your position uh, uh, privileged position of observation you know, from your, uh, your office in Geneva, where you are in touch with so many activities that UNHCR and also partners are uh, implementing in the field, what is being done? What do you think are the most important uh, experiences in the field that are taking place in this moment to respond to the needs identified? Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Guli. Uh, great questions, uh, not so easy to answer in uh, a few minutes. I will do my best. Um, I think the first point I would like to make, which I think you alluded to a little bit gully already, is that um, the baseline figures of mental health problems among refugees and other forcibly displaced people is already higher than in other populations. And the WHO estimates around 22% of adults in conflict settings have significant mental health conditions. And that's almost triple compared to, to other settings. So that's the baseline situation. And then on top of that, uh, COVID comes, which makes it considerably more complicated. Um, now, you asked what the effects are, and I think, uh, I think it's multifold, but I think, to already tell you my point of view, I think most of those effects are indirect indirect effects that actually will manifest themselves um, uh, progressively. So many people who were able to cope reasonably well before um, will now be, find themselves in situations where they, um, they are less able to cope because of all the stressors that are related to the pandemic. So social support systems that become dysfunctional or overburdened, um, people may become sick or die, people afraid to die, but also, of course, the stress levels due to movement restrictions and crowded living conditions, etc. 
but also, and I think that's actually the important part, the fact that income and livelihoods opportunities are threatened. And um, related to that, the frustration among people, uh, which may lead to protection concerns. Um, and more widely in the society, uh, we already see it happening in some places, increased intolerance towards uh, refugees and migrants, uh, more discrimination, xenophobia. Um, of course, there are some groups that are particularly vulnerable, people with pre-existing mental health conditions. I am a doctor after all. Um, who, they really may experience a worsening of their condition and have difficulties in, in accessing uh, appropriate care. Um, care may not even be there, or if it is there, people may find it really difficult to access it. So what I see is the effects are mainly indirect effects. And yeah, it's not nice to say, but I think the worst is yet to come. Now, you also asked me to give me to give some examples of how you could respond. Um, and I just want to do that very briefly. Um, first of all, by referring to a document from the IASC reference group, which has just been cleared today, called Operational Considerations for Multisectoral Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Programs during COVID-19. Uh, we will put it in the, in the notes. Um, and I will mention just um, a few things. First of all, I think we need to um, have massive community messaging about coping with distress, uh, how people can pr protect themselves and how they can manage um, stress in families. Um, secondly, to train first responders in helping others. We call that psychological first aid in the humanitarian world. But there is a new tool, basic psychosocial skills for COVID responders, that I think is very um, is very helpful. And I think that it is already happening, but it could be done even more. Massive training in, uh, in such skills for anyone who responds to COVID, which could be, could be a nurse, a doctor, could be a police officer, could be a shopkeeper. Three, um, to provide um, access to good information through helplines. A lot of helplines are being set up in different languages for refugees and migrants. But I think it's important to make sure that that's in the right language with the right um, uh, kind of um, tone. Um, the fourth thing I would like to say, obviously, is that people who need psychological therapies um, need to be able to get it, but that needs to be transferred to online modalities, which we see increasingly happen, happening. I cannot go too detailed because my time is almost uh, finished. I want to mention three few more points. Um, one is um, that, um, as I said, people with more severe mental health conditions must have continuous care. And that is a problem. We see that sometimes people cannot uh, get access to those services or they are uh, services are blocked, are reconfigured to COVID centers, etc. And I think here we really need to say essential psychiatric care is essential for survival. So it must happen. Um, Sixth point, people with severe protection risks, like sexual and gender-based violence, need to continue to receive psychosocial support by training the responders. And lastly, very briefly, um, we need to have attention for the well-being of people who are involved in the response, particularly refugees themselves and the refugee volunteers. I may talk more about it later, but I think my time is up, so I will leave it at this. Over to you, Guli. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I have a few follow-up questions, but I think we will keep all the questions uh, after this first round of uh, answers, you know, from you. So uh, be there, you know, and be prepared, you know, to answer, you know, in a few in a few minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, just to remind to everyone that, uh, as you rightly said, all the materials, all the tools that we are mentioning, will be available, you know, on um, on the site and also through the tweet. Uh, discussion that we'll have uh, later on. And they are easily accessible also just Googling the titles that Peter has, uh, uh, has just uh, um, mentioned. Uh, thank you very much again. And now I leave the floor to Teresa, uh, who will bring, as we said, the experiences, uh, the particular experience of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a country with a lot of uh, different categories, if you want uh, to use this, uh, this word of migrants, you know, refugees, internally displaced people because of conflict, economic migrants in the country. And now is facing, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, the return, the mass return 
of Ethiopian migrants uh, who are coming back to their country because they have been expelled to the country where they were working and contributing. We are talking about at least 19,000 you know, Ethiopian, almost 19,000 Ethiopian migrants that have come back up to today, you know, from the beginning of the crisis through port, uh, ports of entry. Uh, Teresa, can you tell us about the experience of trying to support migrants who are returning to Ethiopia and who have to be quarantined upon return, you know, because this is the peculiarity you know, of, uh, of these returns at times of COVID. And uh, what are their specific mental health and psychosocial needs? And uh, what is done to support them emotionally during the quarantine, but also to prepare them to a reintegration that was not planned, will be abrupted, and uh, happening at times, as Peter was saying, of financial hardship and uh, general uh, general uncertainty as well. So thank you very much, Teresa, for your uh, answers. Ah, good. I've managed to unmute myself. Awesome. Thank you, colleagues. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you all for this opportunity to speak to you about our experience here in Ethiopia. Uh, like Guli has mentioned, the issue of immigrants uh, um, in Ethiopia is quite a peculiar one. I would say probably uh, uh, other countries are experiencing the same thing. But when the government of Ethiopia issued a mandatory quarantine uh, uh, beginning uh, around the 23rd of March, that meant that everybody who was coming into the country had to quarantine for 14 days either at a hotel designated, uh, appointed by the government, or in government institutions. So regular travelers would quarantine in, the, in hotels at their own cost, but because the immigrants are facing um, economic challenges, uh, the government is catering to their quarantine for 14 days in various universities uh, in Addis Ababa and also around the country. So initially, um, so we, we can all understand the challenges because uh, uh, first, when they're leaving the country, they had all these uh, great ideas of how they're going to change their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Uh, they have faced very uh, torturous journeys and experiences onto their uh, um, uh, second countries that they're hoping to go to. Uh, some of them have witnessed atrocities. Some of them have been abused. Some of them have been have experienced um, things such as rape and uh, other uh, kind of abuses. So when they reach into those countries, that's when they are hoping that their lives is going to change. And then suddenly they are being forced back into, uh, in, in, into the country. Uh, so um, if we also understand the, the, the journeys that uh, these immigrants take, uh, it's not a very cheap affair to leave the country because most of them have to almost borrow money to help them through the journey because they don't make it on their own. Most of them have to pay off people for safe passage. Well, as safe as we can describe what safe is, but just to get them out of the country. And so uh, they, they leave behind a debt that they're promising to pay when they secure jobs abroad. And then when these don't materialize and they get deported back into the country, they're just not dealing with uh, dreams that are quashed, dreams that are not realized, but then they're having to deal with issues of COVID, something that maybe they had not even thought about. Uh, so just having to go through that and then introduce COVID has been very, very difficult for them uh, because now they have to be forced, uh, they have to be quarantined in a government facility that uh, is not uh, exactly up to par, but that will do for the time that they are there. One of the very challenges, of the very first challenges that we had was that information was not passed to them um, in a, in, uh, early on so that they are prepared mentally and they know that when they come back in, they're going to go into quarantine and things like that. Unlike regular travelers who had the option and they knew that when they got into the country, they would have to quarantine for 14 days. So there was a lot of uh, frustration from them in wondering especially why they have to stay in individual rooms when, when they were in the Gulf countries, they were all together in one room or before they were deported, they were all together. 
uh, in a prison uh, cell, so they're, they're not understanding why suddenly we're talking about physical distancing, we're talking about wearing masks, we're talking about, you know, uh, hand hygiene and things like that. So it took a lot of, and it, it is taking a lot of awareness creation uh, on the part of the councillors that are working with them. So uh, let me just backtrack a little bit. So when they were sent into these quarantine facilities, uh, there are different agencies that are supporting them, IOM included, who are doing a very good job in the quarantine facilities, I must say. Uh, the Ministry of Peace has also been supporting. And also for the mental health and psychosocial support, we sent in a team of psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, and social workers to kind of prepare them and to help them understand the situation that they find themselves in. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, most of them are super uh, stressed out because of what they left behind uh, when they left the country. So they were hoping to have a better life for themselves and their families. Now they're coming back to that same life that they were trying to get away from. So most of them are very uh, uh, stressed out about it. Uh, many of them are afraid of how they're going to face their families and their friends, especially those who borrowed money for their travel abroad. Many are also traumatized of the experiences that they went through, watching sometimes their friends die. Uh, some of the women are traumatized because of their own personal experiences of rape, and unfortunately, uh, some resulting in uh, pregnancies. Uh, so we have deployed a team of the three professionals that I mentioned, the social workers, psychologists, and the psychiatrists. One, to offer uh, individual counseling uh, to the ones that need it. We are also supporting them in um, group counseling activities that they're able to, to, to sit in a group, putting all the IP measures in place and talk about their experiences. And if somebody from there on the next individual follow-up, it's scheduled with a therapist. From those groups, then the psychologists are able to identify those who might need further support. And towards this, we have identified a facility, a mental health facility here in Addis, where we have been referring the clients who need further psychosocial support, where they go meet with psychiatrists and the psychiatry nurses who are able to prescribe medication for those who need it to just help them cope for a short period of time. So we are doing the individual counseling, the group counseling and referral services for them to help them cope and to help them understand the situation that they find themselves in. Uh, another thing that we are trying to do to support them is to link them up with services back in their regions because once they finish the quarantine period here in Addis, then they go back to their home regions where they originally came from. So there are reasons why they left those areas to begin with. So we are trying to link them up with services in those areas. Uh, although I must say this has been a big challenge, uh, because there are not as many actors out in the regions as probably there are in Addis. Uh, so that has been a bit of a challenge, but we are trying to identify more and more partners to support so that they do not start to make the precarious journey back into these countries again. Because that is what they're telling our psychologists, that is what they're telling our people, that as soon as they get back home and they're able to get out, they're going to try and do it again. And we see how what and, and, and how challenging that has been for them. So uh, these are some of the interventions that we are trying. Not easy, but we we will try to work together to meet their needs. Uh, back to you, Guli. I'm sure I've run out of my five minutes. <laughs> yeah, a bit so, but never mind. You know, it was uh, extremely interesting. You know, your explanation of the different passageway. It's quite interesting because you know we deal with the return of migrants all the time. You know, in uh, in normal times. Uh, we, I mean, IOM, and we usually um, uh, are sad because we don't have enough time to prepare the people to the reintegration once they are back in the country. In this case, they have actually, they could have this time because this time could be used to prepare them better, you know, in overcoming the issue of shame, you know, and the issue of, as you said, you know, the, the relations with the family and so on. 
uh, but unfortunately it's under this uh, situation that doesn't allow really to do it fully. But thank you very much, uh, uh, Teresa. And now I pass to Rama Idamashan, who has been for many years involved in education rights and citizens programs specifically targeted to marginalized urban communities, including uh, basic support for the urban poor during COVID-19. Uh, as I said, this is happening in Mumbai, in India. Um, in India, the lockdown to respond to the COVID-19 crisis resulted in a huge, very big numbers of Indian citizens who had migrated internally for work to be stranded and unable to go back to their original villages or, uh, or town, hometowns uh, after, uh, not during the pandemic. Uh, in addition, I understood from uh, my discussion with uh, Rama, they have faced quite an unequal challenges in accessing uh, the established support mechanism in the city uh, in which they are living, like Mumbai. So Rama, could you tell us some, some more, something more about the particular factors that impacted on the mental health and well-being of internal migrants in India? And uh, what practical support have you seen uh, be effective in addressing uh, this particular population? Uh, good evening from India, whatever the time zones are, and thank you, Guri, and uh, I would like to thank all of you for bringing this very relevant issue to the fore today. Um, I must uh, begin by saying that I'm a migrant by choice and not by compulsion. Uh, well, uh, Guri, I, I remember you talking about categories right at the beginning and how we should not be categorizing, but I think conceptually that is that is what we saw manifested in India, where the categories became extremely sharp in terms of migration by choice and migration by force. Uh, if you look at um, uh, uh, published reports, uh, we know for sure that by the Indian estimate, 400 and we have 454 million uh, migrants within the country. And if you look at the capital of India and Bombay, which is the commercial capital of India, 43% of the population of both the cities comprise migrants. The population is comprised of migrants according to our own statistical uh, data published by the government. Now, uh, what the COVID-19 pandemic has done, uh, it has really blurred boundaries and has distressed the federal structure of the Indian state mechanism as such. Because while we say that within the geographical, the physical mapped boundary of India, we are all Indians. But what has been thrown into a very sharp relief is the issue of internal migration, where the state and the center has uh, almost clashed in terms of owning citizens who have migrated years back to the cities and as Teresa was mentioning to reclaim their spaces to reclaim right uh, rightful livelihood uh, opportunities etc and after the part partition of india this is probably one of the biggest exodus of the human population that we have witnessed in the indian context so that is the broader context uh, in terms of psychological issues I think one of the biggest uh, issues has been the rural-urban divide like never before, where people have wanted to go back to their land, their people. So based on my multiple conversations with people who have stayed back in the megapolis, they have all stayed back under the fear of, um, especially in this pandemic, where social distancing has been the refrain, the constant rhetoric. So one of the biggest fears has been, uh, and I quote them, that what will happen because I will die in a quarantine facility with my loved ones not being around me. So that has been one of the biggest psychological fears that people have often talked about. My land, my people being away from my loved ones. And I think that has been one of the biggest stress factors uh, in addition to this, of course, a huge loss of livelihood for uh, internal migrant laborers who are almost invisibilized in the cityscape, if you look at it. You know, so if I, if I think about the uh, people who are domestic health, people who are drivers, people who work as janitors, security guards, etc., 
come from some of the remotest and poorest districts of India. And suddenly, uh, uh, we have issues of ethnicity within the city, uh, where one aspect, one section of the city wants these people out of the city so that places are less crowded. And we must understand that I am right now representing a city which by far has one of the uh, uh, highest population densities in the world. I'm talking from Bombay, which is highly dense uh, when it comes to population. Now, uh, one of the other aspects that I wanted to bring about was uh, young people, especially girls, and what they have faced uh, uh, across this pandemic. Uh, a lot of them have told us that, you know, our aspirations of rising in education of uh, access to choosing a partner are highly challenged because we are now forced to go back to our villages and conform to cultural and uh, ethnic, uh, uh, you know, mores or norms that they had challenged when they were living in a city. So ethnic boundaries are becoming sharper with a reverse migration from the city back to the villages, you know, and young people are facing this again and again. Now coming to some of the responses, uh, one of the biggest response that we could strategically bring about was mapping the phone numbers of people uh, and constantly connecting with people, actually talking, listening, and communicating correct information. Correct uh, Lack of correct information was one of the biggest challenges throughout this pandemic. And uh, just to uh, summarize it briefly, what we did was to address stigma through video calls and through working with the police system and neighbors in the community, training volunteers and frontline public health workers to address issues of stigma, anxiety, and fear that is all pervasive. And the, my last point in terms of response would be the way we went about facilitating access to public system responsible for food security, health infrastructure, addressing domestic violence, and uh, training, actually training migrant workers to access helplines that were set up. See, helplines were set up, but it's a different tool and operational exercise to actually access those helplines and figure out the numerous ways of accessing those. Uh, lastly, assisting a few migrant workers with documentation to access entitlements. Because in a large country like this, with a huge rural urban divide, documentation often poses one of the biggest challenges to accessing social protection benefits. Uh, so that's how I would like to summarize the uh, responses, the effective mechanisms of uh, practical uh, purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rama. It was uh, extremely informative. And what you say about the portability of rights is extremely important. You know, in many countries, even though by our humanitarian agencies, my internal migrants are not considered of concern, you know, because they can access the system. In reality, in especially bigger countries, health rights are mainly not portable. You know? So you cannot really use the same rights that you have in your origin village of hometown in the new one, you know, unless you are registered in certain ways. This is happening in many countries. I think it's a very important, important issue. Thank you so much. And now I uh, leave the floor to Lynn Jones. In the last few years, Lynn, you have been volunteering with groups supporting refugees and asylum seekers in the Aegean Islands in Greece and in Calais in, uh, in France. Uh, and you have remained connected to them during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, you have been raising for a long time concerns about policies and actions of governments that you have described as human rights violations, which cause distress and harm, harder and unnecessary distress and harm to already vulnerable children and adults. Um, if I might say, you have worked at the center of a contradiction, you know, an hypocrisy that COVID-19 has helped us unveil spaces that are created for the alleged security of those communities, like identification centers, administrative detention centers, or spaces created for the protection of migrants, like camps that start as a temporary measure but then are maintained for years, are now, without any possible masking, appearing for what they are, spaces where even basic public health measures are impossible. Not spaces of protection, not spaces of security, but spaces of vulnerability for the migrants who live there and for the communities which surround them. 
So please, uh, can you tell us what are the key concerns and, and why they must be addressed to protect the mental health and psychosocial well-being of the adults and children in these settings, especially during the pandemic, but not only. Thank you, Julie. I mean, a way you've summarised for me, but I'll start, I'll go back before the pandemic because I have a, I'm just going to start with a quote from a young Syrian refugee who didn't want to join the fighting on either side. He spent three years uh, floating around the asylum system in Greece and what he says sums up the mental health effect of being trapped in this inhumane system in Europe. They put you in a place for making monsters, he says. If you want to turn a peaceful man into a monster, just make him wait for things that he does not understand that he is waiting for. Make him swim in the flashbacks of his old life. Just let him lie and stare at the ceiling of the tent, remembering and thinking about every single bad moment through which he passed. You feel like there's a volcano inside you. I'm in my twenties. The age is full of energy and you are lying there doing nothing. So you get panic attacks and feel utterly changed. This is the way to make monsters. I'm glad to say, when I last saw him on Samos last year, he was doing okay, as so many refugees, helping others in a legal center. But what COVID has done is actually brought out how hostile this hostile environment really is. And it starts outside the country. What we've had in the last few months in Greece, in Malta, in the seas around Europe is constant illegal pushbacks on land borders as well. <laughs> Greek boats towing boats of migrants into Turkish waters. The Maltese refusing the international obligations at sea, actually sending a boat, I believe, by, at gunpoint onto Italy, returning migrants to illegal, inhumane detention centers that both UNHCR and IOM, I'm glad to say, have complained about in Libya. 61 people died a few days ago in a boat leaving Tunisia, it goes on and on. If you're fortunate enough to make it to land, I have to tell you, I have worked all over the world, like you and Peter, and I have never seen the conditions in refugee camps on the Somali border or in Pakistan or in other countries that I have seen in Calais and France. They are disgusting and inhumane, and they have got far worse under COVID. You've got 30,000 people on the Aegean Islands at the moment, six times the capacity for which the tiny little prison in Mario was designed for, camped out on the squalid bits of plastic. Before the pandemic, they had poor access to food and water, but at least volunteers were trying to provide that. With the lockdown, the access to food and water was diminished, the, in, uh, the healthcare was diminished, the access to leaving the camp was shut down completely. And what has happened? Greece, to its credit, has handled the pandemic well. They've lifted lockdown, they're allowing tourists back. So you have this paradox of tourists on the beaches and on World Refugee Day, lockdown for people in the camps and reception areas was extended, as was all their restrictions on movement until at least July the 5th. And the conditions are really unbelievable. As you said, Julie, social distancing is impossible. There's inadequate supplies of soap and masks. There's inadequate access to water, sometimes a toilet for 200. You have to spend hours and hours queuing for food where it's impossible to be separate for someone else. The quarantining systems for those who are tested positive are useless. They, they keep large numbers of people together. And the worst thing is that in all this space, you have nothing to do. The social spaces, the educational spaces, the recreational spaces that provided some protection, they no longer exist because the volunteers have withdrawn. The application, asylum application process was suspended for two months in Greece. It's been reintroduced, but with very tight timelines, which because given the restriction on movement, make it impossible for refugees to access. So basically, we are imprisoning refugees and asylum seekers on the borders of Europe. I haven't got time to go into Calais. I will just briefly say that for unaccompanied minors, it's even worse. I actually looked up the figures this morning. There are almost 300 in so-called protective custody, which means they're living in prisons where they share beds, they have no access to healthcare, they are vulnerable to abuse. You've got nearly a thousand on the streets of Athens. I could go on and on. You have an inhumane, dangerous system. And the tragedy is, if you don't take care of these people, you actually run the risk of harming yourselves. So for me, it's inexplicable. In my follow-up, I'll tell you what I suggest we could do about it. I've used my time.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. You know, unfortunately, we won't have the time for a second round of questions, you know, as we had originally planned. So I would like to conclude this and uh, sorry, no, but I have to go back to it because I, I really feel about it. That's exactly the explanation of when a space built for supposed protection becomes actually a space of vulnerability, the one for you know, unaccompanied, unaccompanied minors. However, you know, to go um, to go back to our uh, to our uh, flow, uh, I would like uh, each one of you now, you know, to conclude with a quick recommendation. What is the main take away from you from for you for, from your discussion? What is the main recommendations you want also to? propose to the people who are following this webinar what can be done you know in the different sectors and peter in uh, doing your if you can you know there was a question from the floor that i think is very important it is about what to do for uh, people who need uh, specialized mental health care in places where uh, there is nothing nearby you know so what can be done in that case the floor is to you. I think we can follow the same uh, flow. So we start with Peter and then go with uh, Teresa Rama and uh, conclude with Lynn. Uh, Peter, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. So my the takeaway message that I would like to give is about the importance of integrating mental health and psychosocial support in all uh, aspects of humanitarian uh, work, which is way beyond specialists. So it is irrelevant for each and every one. So that is the main message, which I think I also mentioned before. Now, the question from the audience is going to the other side of the spectrum. So what about those people who actually need, um, uh, need more intensive um, mental health care in places where it's not available? Now, there is, of course, no answer. We need to provide resources to do that, but it's not totally unique. This is the humanitarian context where we always work in, where we have to work with limited means. So so my answer for that one would be to um, work um, with capacity building of general health workers and general social workers with supervision, which you can also do by phone. So it would be task sharing, including um, um, intensive supervision through phone. Over. Thank you very much, Peter. If I can add just uh, one second, uh, one thing to that, you know, people who don't have access to mental health care are not only people who live far away from services, but are by instance irregular migrants in most of places where there are services. That's right. But services are located at the third level, you know, of care, That's for right. which you need registration. You know, so people are not able to reach them, and there the recommendation probably would be to try to mainstream as much as possible mental health care at the primary health care level, but also make sure and continue lobbying so that everyone can have universal health access, so that everyone is entitled to have all access to all levels. Yeah, health mental health care is essential health care. That is the point. It's essential health care right. and it's right. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Teresa. You have to uh, you you, and and Yes, I think I've managed to do that. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pick up where Peter has left in terms of mainstreaming mental health. And here in Ethiopia, we are doing that through the health cluster, where in the last uh, Ethiopian months, uh, an 8% allocation was made to mental health to support the activities, not just for COVID, but also for other essential services and for mental health incorporated into them. In Ethiopia, we also have the advantage of a very strong um, uh, healthcare extension workers that now we are realizing we will have to work with because we are also moving into community case management and that means we will have more and more people that need mental health care in the communities rather than in the quarantine or treatment facilities. So we are working in training as uh, health healthcare extension workers to support with PFA like we've had. You don't have to be a specialist to do psychological first aid. So we are doing that Thank you to so support much. and to reach as many people. In Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you so much. And we go to uh, Rama. Uh, I, I shall not repeat. Uh, actually, Peter and Teresa have summarized what I uh, had written down for myself. But just to add to it, I would say that as a means of state policy, we need more and more investment and allocations to primary level psychosocial support for, and building capacities of frontline workers and community first aid, aid mental health uh, uh, interventionists 
together and to treat mental health support as a as an issue of social justice rather than just a clinical intervention i i totally agree thank you very much and this brings us to the last uh, to the last uh, panelist lynn which i think you know really much agree with us as well uh, lynn you have to unmute yourself Uh, yes, I'm going to move to the other end of the IASC pyramid that people are familiar with, which means that you can't have good mental health if you can't access your basic needs and you're not secure. If you really want to improve the mental health of asylum seekers and migrants in Europe, you have to stop the discriminatory treatment of them and you have to give them freedom to access general health care, never mind mental health care. You have to address their basic needs and the most important solution is political. The reason that France and Greece and Italy are in this situation is because the rest of Europe is refusing to do its proper share, take its share, burden sharing. We need all of us to be lobbying our politicians to take migrants, refugees into our countries. Ethiopia puts me to shame, Uganda puts me to shame. 85% of refugees are in countries like that and we quarrel and keep these people in inhumane and degrading conditions where their mental health deteriorates. It's disgusting and I'm ashamed to be a European, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Lynn. I think it's a concern that a lot of us share. And obviously, you know, you having the freedom not to work for a big international organization, I've been very vocal about that, you know, for, for a long time now. Uh, I, I would like to conclude with these words and also to say basically that the bottom line is uh, that there is no mental health without uh, rights and there is mental, no mental, mental health without humanity, which uh, I think is something that is true for everyone and particularly true for migrants in a time where the migration, discourse, the migration discourse is so poisoned and so politicized and uh, it is uh, uh, going uh, probably to go worse uh, after the pandemic because of what Peter was saying, you know, the increased xenophobia, the increased fear of the other that uh, by default, you know, the, the, the pandemic and the measures related with the pan pandemic had brought, you know, in, uh, in many, many communities. I leave the floor to Ananda for the final remarks and thank you to all the panelists. It was a very informative and uh, discussion and uh, thank you for all the ones who participated for their attention i'm sorry we couldn't have a second round of questions thank you Guli. Uh, on behalf of the organizers of the seminar series i'd like to uh, thank you peter um teresa rama lynn uh, for your insights your passion and and those recommendations uh, i've actually been getting messages during the webinar from colleagues around the world uh, who are thanking you for raising the very issues that they're they're seeing and and are very concerned about so thank you on their behalf um uh, the recording and, and notes of the session today including some of the links to some of the resources will be posted on the website unitedgmh.org uh, in the next couple of days uh, i'd like to invite all of you uh, who are who are joining this webinar remotely uh, to to tune in next week uh, at the same time on the 30th of june uh, for the webinar which will be on workplace mental health uh, and you can register on 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 unitedgmh.org um but but before you go just uh, also an invitation to join um us on twitter right after this using the hashtag um covid19 mh uh peter lynn and guli uh, are on twitter and will be able to comment uh, uh or respond to some of your questions or commentaries uh, i might be able to post some of your questions uh uh, or responses on behalf of Teresa and Rama. Uh, and if you um, work with or are yourself a refugee, migrant, or asylum seeker, please do share your um, insights and experiences. Thank you very much for joining us today. And we hope to see you first on Twitter, but also next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Honestly. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.